Hey everyone, welcome to the Being Patient Podcast. I'm Deborah Kahn, founder of Being Patient. When my mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, I decided to use my skills as a journalist in a different way. Frustrated by the lack of information on science and the inability to get different expert opinions, I decided to quit my job at the Wall Street Journal to create a better platform for people impacted by dementia. We are a community where news and information is created by our team of journalists. We ask tough questions and we simplify the science so that anyone can understand. We don't only cover disease, but delve into the latest research on what it takes to keep our brains healthy. We invite the experts and ask your questions. Here's today's podcast. I hope you enjoy it. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Being Patient. I'm Deborah Khan, founder of Being Patient. Uh, welcome to Brain Talks, I should say. Um, today, joining me is Dr. Daniel Potts. He is a neurologist at the Tuscaloosa Veterans Medical Center and also um, had a father with Alzheimer's disease. Welcome so much, Daniel. Thank you, Deborah. It's a pleasure to be on. Thanks for asking me. Okay, so this is what I love about our community um, that, you know, we meet people like you um, who come from come to Alzheimer's from all different perspectives. Um, you know, you're a neurologist, you see patients um, with neurodegeneration, and you also had a, your own personal experience with your dad. Um, tell us a little bit about your dad's situation. I'd be happy to. Um, so yeah, it's unusual. I'm a neurologist, an only child, and my father had Alzheimer's. And so there, there are probably not all that many of us out there that, that are talking about this at this point. But dad was a great, dad was a great guy. He was a, he was a Korean War veteran. Uh, he was a, a good, solid uh, a woodworker, sawmiller, farmer, rural Alabama guy. And uh, he married uh, an English teacher. Uh, and so my mom and dad uh, raised me in rural Alabama, small town Alabama. And uh, um, dad was uh, the best man I've ever known. You know, he continues to be my, my, my idol and I looked up to him in so many ways. And so dad was, dad was a good father to have good husband and, and mother, a good mother as well. So you have an amazing story. Uh, I, I, you know, there's so many things I really want to talk to you about, but let's just start with your dad's story because it's such a beautiful thing. Um, what you learned about your dad after he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, you know, you said your dad grew up and worked in rural Alabama. You had no idea he was actually an artist and had artistic talent. Tell us about uh, that realization and how it came about. So, so creating art was not something that anyone have would have believed my dad would have done or would have been interested in, because he was he was a, a utilitarian child of the the, the depression years. But once my dad began to show signs of Alzheimer's disease, which was eventually diagnosed as Alzheimer's, he attended an adult daycare program here in our town, um, which is just a wonderful place. And dad went there and was validated and supported in his current situation and was given the opportunity to explore um, talents and gifts that he may still have, even though there were some losses. And one of those was the expressive arts. And so there was a retired art teacher named George Parker that volunteered his time at Caring Days. Uh, he himself was not a, an art therapist, but, but he really knew how to sort of facilitate this process. And so dad, dad did it. Mother said, Lester's not going to do that. You can try it, but he won't do it. Oh, and behold, my dad loved it. And he painted over 100 watercolors, uh, some of the most beautiful things that I've ever seen. And I still look at these and say, I can't believe he did this. And I, I, the reason why this is such a mind blowing, amazing story is Alzheimer's led you to believe, to know something within your dad that you, you never even knew. And maybe he didn't even know. Do you think he knew he had artistic talent? Was he ever given the opportunity to paint? No, I don't think he did. It wouldn't have been something that he really explored. Now, he was creative. I mean, he built things, he woodworked, and, and, but it was all about fixing stuff. It was all about producing stuff. And so he would not have taken the time to explore the aesthetic side of things. So no, I don't think he knew he had it. Okay, so tell us what, I mean, and, and I love this too, because 
you know, a neurodegenerative disease, we can all be very doom and gloom about it, right? But this had unleashed something where you got to know your dad in a way you may have never gotten to know him before. So tell us what you found out through the art. It's the truth. You know, it was it was a dark time. I don't want to minimize the 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 effects that that that, that people have to deal with with this condition. But dad dad was depressed for his losses. His language was leaving. His memory, et cetera, and uh, he was not able to do the things that he that he needed to do to uh, take care of himself day by day. But after going to caring days and being exposed to the art, he perked up. He blossomed. His his affect changed. He was now producing things. So some of the most interesting art that he produced was actually memories that he had, that he had had of childhood and, and of people and relationships and um, uh, actually places that he, that he frequented as a, as a young person. So saws, logs on end, uh, he painted wood rings and ducks and things like that. He painted his father's shoes and hat people that he worked with in the sawmill, a, a man named Albert, that was a good friend of his, he painted these at a time when he could not reminisce with us verbally and could not tell his story. So his story got out through art. It was incredible. To so what were, what were, what do you think some of the messages he was trying to send you all were through his art? Well, you know, it, it, I've, I've thought a lot about this and, and I, I've tried to put myself as best I can empathetically in the shoes of someone who may be living with dementia or cognitive impairment. Um, I think, you know, this tragedy narrative that you mentioned is, is out there and is kind of the dominant narrative. And, and we do understand that people are going through a hard time, no doubt. But there's something, I think, in the human being, all of us, that uh, can, can sort of well up and support us uh, when we are being challenged like this. And for dad, I think it was his faith background. I think it was his strong family rootedness and love. And I think it was those relationships that had buoyed him up all these years and the sense of occupational identity that my dad had and he hung on to. He was a sawmiller. He was a hard worker. He was dependable. So he pulled from that deep well uh, that, that was still inside of him. And I think he expressed that richness and put it on canvas, you know, is the best I can explain it. He was, he needed something to buoy him up and he reached in and found it with the help of others who cared for him and who knew how to facilitate this. And guess what? It also buoyed us up. I mean, I was sinking in a deep place and, and my mother too, and all of us who loved dad, we drew energy from the very one who was living with dementia. And, and that energy continues to motivate me today, actually. It's, it's, un, it's unbelievable. And what, a, what an amazing legacy to leave, right? To have his art. I mean, it, that's, what an amazing story. I, I wanna go more into the um, details about that. And, and I wanna see, you know, maybe you could show us some, some examples, but before we do that, I wanna, I, I have to ask Daniel as the neurologist, now, you obviously decided to become a neurologist before your dad had Alzheimer's. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So how has your experience with your own father changed you as a doctor seeing patients with neurodegeneration? Well, it's a great question. And I have to say, I went into neurology because his father, my grandfather, had a series of strokes that eventually took his life. So I was a little boy. He was my best friend. I wanted to help people who had strokes. So that's why I went into this, not knowing that his son, my father, was going to be experiencing Alzheimer's. But, but there are many things that it has done, and it has changed my outlook. One of the primary things it has done, I've already mentioned, is that I've learned to, to try to look inside the person and not just see loss that I've been trained to see, deficits, disability that I've been trained to see as a neurologist, but to see what remains and to build on strengths that people have. So I always try to support them through that. Um, it's taught me to be hopeful in this and other conditions that, that seem on the outside to be hopeless. It's taught me that I need to listen to caregivers, care partners, and support them better. It's taught me that I need to take care of myself as a physician, because one of the things that happened to me, Deborah, going through this was that I burned out. And, and, I, and I and my family struggled through that burnout. But, but my own father and his carers showed me that I've got to be compassionate toward myself or I can't be compassionate toward anybody else. I always listen to the person with dementia 
first. And interestingly, when a, when a care partner and a person with dementia come to my office, I always make a point because that's the patient. I always make a point to listen to that person first, even though they may be confused about some of the details. We can fill those in in a minute, but I always focus on that human being. And I believe that I can help people live well now because I've seen uh, people help my dad live well. So I focus on living well. I know I can't cure things at this point, but I do the best I can to give people the resources they need and the support they need and the tools they need to live well with this condition. Yeah, and that's it. like the segment we did just last week uh, um, with people diagnosed with dementia. That was the main, you know, one of the main points was when you receive a diagnosis of dementia, you, there's a lot of good years in there, right? It's like, but because of the stigma dementia carries, people automatically assume you're at a later stage, which is so untrue, you know, and, and yes. so depressing really to think, yes, oh, I have a diagnosis. This means that's it, you know, and yes. when there's a lot of life as your father definitely proved, right? Sure, I mean, right. What, what those same would... people, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Some of those same people that you just talked about interviewing, I've talked to some of them as well. And, and one of the things that I've also tried to do since talking to them is to change the way I diagnose people is to bring a more compassionate, empathetic, understanding, non-hurried clinical um, scenario to that and to then give them support and hope after that diagnosis. Because to be honest with you, I'm embarrassed when I hear about people getting a diagnosis and, and how it's, it's, it's done not like the way I just said so I'm trying to do better with that. And people with dementia have taught me so much about that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I wanted, we had some questions um, that were sent to us um, from people um, anticipating your talk. Um, Tammy Mays um, right, wrote to us and said, you know, I care for, for my 77 year old father with vascular dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, within the past month, he's declined rapidly, both cognitively and physically. He's no longer able to write, gets easily confused and disoriented. His gross motor function has declined and he's begun experiencing incontinence. His physical therapist doesn't seem alarmed, nor does his primary care doctor. So her question to you is, we, she's saying, you know, we seem to be struggling with professionals who see this as a natural progression of this disease. So this is apropos to what we we're just saying um, and our own shock and fears. Where do we draw the line between accepting and adapting to these rapid changes versus pressing his doctors to take a deeper dive into his rapid uh, decline? So I guess too much of the answer is like, well, yeah, of course, the person has Alzheimer's or some sort of dementia instead of, wait, what's actually triggering this problem? And there, is there something I should be concerned with? What a great question. And, and there's so much there. What I think it requires is a, is a reframing of things. Certainly, the first component of that is that we have to address the denial that we all have. We, we've got to really look at this and say, yes, we know this is going to get worse. Yes, we know we don't have a cure now. So I'm not going to kick and scream myself into this. I'm going to walk with my loved one through this, getting all the support I can and realize it's going to get worse. However, the reframing also entails looking for um, uh, where we see loss and actually looking for gifts that may be remaining there. So giving someone the best opportunity to live well means listening well. It means looking for the person, the elements of personhood that are still there. Uh, the things that we love about our dad or our mom or our husband or wife are still present. And we can learn how to build on those, build a relationship on those expose them to nature, expose them to creativity, expose them to kids if we can, I know we're in a pandemic, uh, expose them to loving and supportive relationships. The milieu that create that we create around them has to be supportive. I love one of the things Tipa Snow says, which is, you know, Alzheimer's and dementia steal so much. Why would I want to contribute to the theft? And I think actually as a physician, I may have contributed to the theft in some of my patients. I don't want to do that anymore. But not all of us, and I'm speaking to myself, get it as clinicians. We're looking at cure. We're looking at treatment, medications. We have a terminal illness. We don't see the living well part as being as important as it should be. And, and yeah. I'm learning myself. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's so true. Um, and if you think about how emotional Alzheimer's is as a disease for everyone, for the person di diagnosed to, you know, the, the, the loved ones caring for, for the person. I mean, addressing the mo emotional needs is so important, right? For yes. um, just better quality of life. Um, so tell, let's go back to your dad, because I'm fascinated mm -hmm. by his paintings. So, you know, he never painted before, learns wow. how to paint or discovers this talent he has within himself when he's, um, was he in a full-time care facility or was this no, just a day just program? Just a day, day program. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, lo and behold, they put paint a paintbrush in front of him and he truly has artistic talent. Tell, yes. tell us a little bit about some of the things, like you mentioned before about the wood, but what do they mean? And, and give us some examples. So um, one of the things that, that I want to show you, and I've got, I've got a book here, by the way, that, that we did of dad's art called The Broken Jar, and actually my poetry, because I started writing poems after my dad started painting. I'd never written a poem before, so that's almost as amazing as dad painting. But, um, <laughs> I love that. But, we, but we paired them together and got a book here. But one of these one of these paintings that's probably dad's best known painting is this one we call the Blue Collage. And in this Blue Collage are images of his home and his father. There's a crosscut saw. There's a high top shoe. There's a cross with a hat on it. And so that is, an, that is an abstract image of dad's father because Big Daddy always had a hat on, he always had high top shoes and he was always pulling a crosscut saw. So at a time when dad could not say that's what that was, he was painting his own father. There are rocks, leaves, bird houses, which dad used to make all the time and give people and there are trees. So this really is sort of an abstract image of his early life. So, it's, so Lester is painting his narrative in, in art therapy. And I think one of the things that was happening was that because of the supportive care he was getting and because of the opportunity to create and be in the moment and be sort of in that zone uh, that, we, that, that, we, that we talk about is that you know, artists have, he was able to access some of those remote memories and bring them out and support his own personhood. That's one of the things that, that's so powerful. This, this, the expressive arts enable one to support their own personhood, I think, because you can pull that narrative out. And so he was painting with his colors of yesterday on a picture of today for dad. So he was actually able to bring the Alzheimer's thread through the, through the painting. And, and I think one of the things that art therapy does and some of the other therapies is enables people to deal with traumas that they've had, that they're dealing with and, and get that emotional expression out through, through the, through the art. And a therapist um, is very trained at, at helping someone do that. So, I mean, it's just, truly amazing that you can see that in his paintings. Did it, was it decoding? I mean, at what, at what, what stage was he at when he started to paint in Alzheimer's? Well, interestingly, when he um, really did some of his best work, uh, he was moderate stage. I mean, he was already having a terrible short-term memory loss, aphasia, he couldn't get his words, couldn't put a sentence together. He had trouble even fixing a garden gate, plugging, plugging in a lamp. Um, addressing himself. So he was, he was moderately staged when he began to do this and even did some stuff in late stage. As a matter of fact, the last image uh, that we have of his was probably his earliest childhood memory. Actually, this is not the last image, but it's the last one he painted at Caring Days. That I believe to be a saw without the handles. And so, I mean, and you, look, it's very, um, it's, it's, it's not colored. It, it's, it's probably done with pencil. And interestingly, that, that, that's different than his other art. He had so much art that was brightly colored, beautiful. Um, this, was a, this was an earlier piece here, but, um, but, but, it, but it lost some of its color and he eventually came down to blues, greens, and eventually no color at all. But that saw really speaks to us because that's the ten tenacity and the steeliness and the strength of, of, of his family and everything right there on the canvas for us. He's still there. Lester's still there. That is so amazing. I'm getting goosebumps as, as you show us this. And so how how difficult was he was he able to speak when he when he painted or when he was in moderate? A, was a little still... bit. A little bit, but not um, not much. But the time he painted images like that, he was not able to tell us what he was painting. For instance, when he painted 
a, a picture of him, and let me see if I can find it, him and his friend Albert Corder, who worked with him in the sawmill, pulling a saw together. When he painted that, he could not tell us who that was pulling the saw with him. And I'm sorry, I don't have an image of that right now. But there, there's, a, there's a, a white man and a black man pulling the saw together. And these, these two guys loved each other. and were, were uh, All their lives, they respected and loved each other. And I, we saw that image and we said, Dad, we knew who it was. We said, Dad, is that Mr. Albert? And all he could do was put his hand on Albert and cry. That's what he did. He put his hand over there and cried. And that relationship, you see, was very important to Dad. My dad told me one time, if something happens to me, call Albert. It continued to be important to him even late in life when he couldn't speak anymore. That showed me ah, the power of relationships to buoy us through our troubles, even the trouble of Alzheimer's. That is truly an amazing, amazing story. And I mean, it, it, I would think, I mean, me, you know, I'm not a scientist, obviously. However, I would think decoding Alzheimer's through art is, is just an incredible thing. I mean, because obviously he is pulling things from his past, right? From his long-term memory. And yes. he's see, he's articulating yes. them through his art. So it's that is an amazing thing. I yes. mean, uh, truly you know, part of the brain, of course, the, the part of the part the part of the brain in dad that that housed a lot of those those long term memories was not as effective as the part that's laying down new memory, of course, because the hippocampus uh, was what what was being hit. So that's sort of the save button. But these remote images were there. Now, they're a little bit different than they would be had he been painting them earlier in life because his visuospatial skills which are coming from you know, this, this right hemispheric parietal lobe, et cetera, those are not exactly right. So the, the, relationship, the spatial relationships are different than they would be. For instance, the saw coming out of the boot. Um, but I find it so fascinating that the, the saw and the boot and the hat are depicted as if someone were small looking at them. The boot is big, the hat is tiny. It's almost like this is coming from way, way back when dad was on the floor crawling, pulling up on his, on his dad's shoes. And I can't prove any of that, but I think it's fascinating uh, that, that that's the case. That is truly fascinating. So, um, Daniel, you had said that you had written poetry. Can you, can you share some of the poetry yeah. you, you, with us? Um, sure. I, I love how, yeah, I, I, I love hearing, that. sorry, my phone just went, I love hearing how you describe the painting. So is, d d does the poetry tree complement the paintings? It does. Um, I have, um, I have started writing uh, poems to dad's uh, art. And so I'm, I'm probably going to get something together with that because the poems in this book that I showed you were just poems and they were not really paired with the art but I've sort of doing that, but this is a poem that, and I'm not a, I, I'm, I'm not a poet or a famous poet, but I, but I do love to write. And I tell you what, this has been very therapeutic for me. I told you I, I, I burned out. So I've learned some wellness practices for myself. This is one of them, including taking photos, et cetera. But I wrote one shortly after dad passed away in his voice. And, and this has actually, the more I visit it has become the primary message that I feel like I got from dad looking back on it. And so, so it's called remember. Remember who you are, my child, who you were born to be. Let love be law in mind and heart. Let life be charity. If bandaged begging hands assail your palisades of calm, let labor bring tranquility. Let healing be its balm. When death itself so stealthily advances through your days. Let quiet faith be your resolve. Let living be your praise. Then when my spirit and my flesh unknit and I am gone, within your heart, the finest part of me continues on. And I hope the finest part of Lester has continued on and will continue on. And the, and the finest part of all of those relationships that we have that may have departed is in us and will continue on. And that's one of the, that's one of the primary themes I've gotten out of all of this. Relationships matter even and perhaps most when we're struggling with a disability uh, or a condition like Alzheimer's.
Absolutely. And we can tell that the artistic talent runs um, deeply in your DNA. <laughs> that oh, the poem was beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that um, with us. Are you, do you have a website or is there a place where people can yeah. see Lester's art and your poetry? Yes. So we have, um, we have, we have a foundation called Cognitive Dynamics, uh, cognitivedynamics.org. It's a not-for-profit that that um, brings the kinds of things we're talking about to folks living with dementia and train students. So we put students in relationships with people living with dementia and we do art therapy and, and, and other therapies with them. So that's cognitivedynamics.org. And then Lester's art, uh, lesterslegacy.com um, is a place where you can look at Lester's art, you can purchase uh, prints if you want or note cards, uh, but we just want to share the art. And then my poetry is on, um, is on a WordPress site uh, called The Wooded Path. So if you put The Wooded Path pots, you know, that'll pull up my poetry. So I got a bunch of poems on there. Great. We'll post those links um, in, in this chat so that people can find them. Okay. But um, Daniel, I just, I, I admire you so much. And the fact that you're a neurologist and what you've learned and what you're communicating for other people to understand too is so important. So thank you so much for, for your time and sharing your story with us. Your dad seems incredibly inspirational and your efforts as well as a neurologist and also just as someone who wants to put um, the spotlight on patients and caregivers is, is tremendous. So thank you so much. Well, my pleasure. And I want to acknowledge my mother, who was the primary caregiver for dad and who was there with him day in and day out, and who, um, as we all know, struggled mightily to bring him the best. And so my hat goes off to care partners, caregivers like my mother. And I want to be the evangelist for living well. I want us as physicians to do a better job to help people live well, even though we can't cure right now. And certainly we hope for cure and research is, is paramount. But that's what I'm here to do. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it so much. Thank you so much. And we'll make sure to post all of those links um, so that people can um, just inquire more. And I, I, and I hope there's, a, there's an email or something that people, if they want to get in touch, or they can do so on one of those sites. Um, they can. The Cognitive Dynamics site has got an email on it. So y'all can get in touch with us. Great. Thank you so much, Daniel. So if you missed any of this My interview, um, go to beingpatient.com. We'll post the interview. And don't forget to sign up for our newsletters because we will let you know when people like Daniel will come and talk to us. Um, and, and it's extraordinary to get a lot of people's times these days because I know everyone's busy. But thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to more conversations. Take care. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. For more information on upcoming interviews, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at beingpatient.com. That's B-E-I-N-G-P-A-T-I-E-N-T.com. And send us any feedback you may have, whether it's someone you want us to interview or any comment about our podcast series. You can do so by emailing info at beingpatient.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. I'm Deborah Kahn.